Good afternoon, uh, everybody out there, and welcome to this conversation. Today, we're going to be discussing the security situation in and around Ukraine against the backdrop of the ongoing conflict in the Donbass and following the recent huge Russian military buildup on Ukraine's border and occupied Crimea. We're going to look at the current situation and the transatlantic response as well as Russian policy and objectives. I think it's fair to say that the Kremlin has well demonstrated its ability to dial up or de-escalate its hybrid war against Ukraine at its will. It seems to me that Russia has not ruled out a military solution to the conflict and may well yet resort to force if the necessary concessions are not forthcoming. We're also going to be looking at the security in the wider Black Sea region and Russia's growing footprint in this area. I mean, for example, it's growing influence these days in Belarus, as well as in the Black Sea region more broadly. Um, for example, Russia's recent uh, peacekeeping deployment um, in Azerbaijan following the uh, last year's uh, Nagorno-Karabakh war. I think it's clear that a sovereign and secure Black Sea and Sea of Azov are critical to keeping the region free uh, from Russia's uh, malign influence. Uh, and today we have a really great panel of guests um, to discuss these issues. And I'm going to introduce them very briefly. Um, first of all, Alina uh, Frolova, who is Deputy Chairman at the Center for Defense Strategies uh, in Ukraine. And she is also former Deputy Minister of Defense. Um, we have retired US Navy Admiral James J. Fogel, who is now a distinguished fellow at the Transatlantic Defense and Security Program at the Center for European Policy Analysis uh, in Washington. Um, from the European Parliament, we have Mrs. Viola van Krampon Taubadel, who is from the Group, group of Greens uh, and European Free Alliance. Uh, and last and certainly not least, we have Sergei Utkin. Um, who's Head of Strategic Assessment Section, Primakov Institute of World Economy and International Relations um, at the Russian Academy of Science. So welcome to all of you. A quick note to the audience, um, although you probably know this uh, already. Um, for your questions, you can either type them into the, the box, the, the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, or alternatively, if you want to actually say your question out loud, please quick click on the hand icon and then my colleague will uh, allow you to speak. Um, I would welcome it very much if you could start to put your questions you know, right from the beginning because that will give me an opportunity to put them to the panelists throughout the discussion. Um, so I'd like to start um, with you, um, Alina. Um, I would like to ask you, um, following Russia's military buildup on Ukraine's border, um, can you now give us uh, an update on the situation uh, today, I mean, on the border itself, um, but also in the, in the conflict zone? Well, the situation actually, uh, let's say, it didn't change so much from the point of view of troops which are located or the weapons and vehicles which are located. So mainly they stay at the same positions. Uh, however, situation has changed uh, a lot from the political influence or let's say hybrid influence which this situation is uh, making because um, the uh, reaction of the Western leaders uh, on this situation gave us a possibility to um, let's say the push on Russia so in public space they announced that they uh, will move out uh, the troops, which is not happening in uh, like a volumes they promised. And we shouldn't be like a very tricked with this because I uh, can give you 100% that they won't move out any troops from Crimea. Uh, and I give you 100% that they won't uh, move out any troops from Belarus, which are also located there for these uh, so-called exercises. So, however, we uh, possibly we can expect some decreasing of troops on the uh, eastern border, like in Donetsk, Lugansk region. And um, the another issue which has changed that we see finally the some kind of practical pressure, not only political pressure, but practical military, let's say, mixed military pressure 
from our key partners when we see the presence of US and uh, UK um, in Black Sea region, uh, which is good and which is like a new um, approach. Uh, because uh, um, from one side, the US and UK did not send the military ships that they planned before, uh, but they sent a patrol uh, one, uh, patrol vessels. Uh, but at the same time, these patrol vessels uh, obviously behave themselves uh, quite, um, uh, let's say, brave. And they do pass all the time and uh, through the so-called Russian economic zone, which never happened before. So that's like a change in balance in some way. And I would say that this like a freezed situation, which can be easily escalated by Russia because they have all the resources in place. Uh, uh, and the only, um, let's say, only way to keep it on some kind of lower position is uh, political pressure. But at the same time, we know that in August, we expect the summit of the Crimean platform, which is the new initiatives of Ukraine and which like highly irritates Russian. And I do expect uh, on August before or after it escalation again as a reaction of Russians on, on what's going on in, with Crimean platform here. That's like a short description. What do you think are Russia's, um, I mean, what were Russia's objectives for this massive troop, uh, troop um, deployment at the border? I mean, what did it hope to get out of it? Um, how, how do you see that? What do, what do you think that was? Well, my feeling is, and this is what actually we as a government and later experts were saying all the time that uh, the um, issue of occupation of Ukraine and the war of Ukraine with Russia and the occupation of Crimea, this is not the issue of Ukraine. And even this is not the issue of the Europe only, uh, because it's highly influenced on the um, interests of all the players and it highly influence on the modern uh, like a, uh, modern order of the international order which we have and the global policy. So my feeling is that the aim of Russia was to pressure on US new administration of US and to pressure on the EU, uh, which started to move uh, their position in more open way. So the US was like a primary target, my feeling. So the Ukraine was used here as the pressure component for uh, uh, the, uh, these political goals. And actually in some way they get what they wanted. They started to have more intensive contacts with the US administration and EU. At the same time, I would say that uh, I, my feeling is they didn't expect so uh, strong reaction and so tough reaction from the EU and uh, US from the point of view of sanctions and potential sanctions and documents which were um, adopted because we never saw such rhetorics before. Uh, so I think that here they had like these two um, goals, these political goals, which are more global than Ukraine only. Uh, the second, this is obviously the demonstration of their power to Ukraine because the la latest negotiations are not successful at all at all the positions. And the third one, I think that it was also some kind of maneuver to hide um, um, the, some military component uh, from the point of view of relocation of troops to Belarus, relocations of more troops to Crimea because this is covered with the exercise goal which is not true, actually. So that's, uh, that's the short description, let's say. Okay, thank you very much, um, Alina. Um, I would like to turn to you now, um, uh, Jamie, um, to ask you a bit about how you see um, the current security situation um, in the Black Sea region. I mean, obviously this region is central, um, to Europe's um, security, not just for Europe, for Eurasia and the Balkans as well. So how would you assess the situation there, there today, um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the growing footprint of Russia in and around the Black Sea? 
Thank you, Amanda. And uh, I think I want to answer the question in the context of my own personal experience as a naval officer and a submariner. So I just retired after almost 40 years of service in the United States Navy um, throughout the Cold War. Uh, it was uh, a different environment back then in a bipolar world. And I spent the, the last uh, 10 years of my life uh, in Europe. Uh, I've commanded nine times. Four of those have been NATO commands, uh, primarily based in Naples, Italy, with Naval Forces Europe, and of course, those ships that sail into the Black Sea. Uh, my first deployment to the Mediterranean during the Cold War was in 1984. And uh, I fell in love with the region and Europe, and I went back to be educated there. Um, I spent uh, my first flag officer assignment in SHAPE headquarters, followed by uh, command of Submarine Group 8 and Allied Submarine South in Naples, Italy in 2010 to 2012. And it was an interesting environment there in a post-Cold War world because uh, things seemed to move along uh, a little smoother uh, with uh, our counterparts in the Russian Federation. And uh, there was uh, much less preponderance of presence of the Russian Navy in the Eastern Mediterranean and certainly in the Black Sea. And I've seen that expand over time. In fact, as I went back as the Sixth Fleet Commander between 2014 and 2016, I relieved uh, Admiral Phil Davidson. He just retired as the Indo PACOM commander. And Phil had two ships in the Black Sea during the Sochi Olympics. He had our command ship, Mount Whitney, and another escort ship. And we actually had a line of communication with the Black Sea Fleet Commander in the event that there was uh, there would be a problem uh, at the Olympics. And so it seemed like the relationship was proceeding about as normal as uh, you might think it would, having been two bipolar adversaries during the Cold War. And then uh, following the Sochi Olympics, everybody was surprised. Uh, we were surprised in Georgia in 2008. We were surprised in Crimea in 2014, uh, when Russia moved into Crimea and illegally annexed it. And since then, it's been tense. So when I went back as the four-star commander of Naval Forces Europe and Africa, uh, I could really uh, feel the tension. Uh, Russia added uh, six kilo-class submarines to the mix. Normally, two of them sail in the Mediterranean out of uh, uh, Tartus and Latakia. That presence has increased enormously as a result of the war against ISIS. And uh, there is a significantly higher Russian presence in the Black Sea today than there ever has been before. It's a crowded environment. And when you think about the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea and the Mediterranean, with the choke points uh, going in through the straits, um, it's a bathtub. And so we need to be uh, circumspect and we need to adhere to norm standards, uh, the law of the sea and uh, proper conduct of naval forces on the surface of the ocean or in the air. So there's no mistakes or miscalculations. Sometimes that kept me awake at night. And most recently, uh, when you saw the buildup of forces along the border in Donbass, which you know I've referred to many times in public speaking and writing as the, the frozen conflict of the 21st century. We're not, we're not moving forward, we just continue to take uh, steps backward. Uh, those 100,000 troops, I think, I agree with Alina, that was a demonstration of force by President Putin. Uh, I know Sergei will have an opinion on this, uh, uh, but that uh, demonstration of force is something I think that the Russians do periodically and what I've referred to in the past also and others have as escalate to de-escalate. So to test and see what the response of the West will be. I agree with Alina that the response, particularly with sanctions uh, from the EU and from the United States and from the Biden administration uh, was strong. And I was very happy to see that uh, President Putin who made a speech and used the term red line, which I thought was interesting, uh, decided uh, to de-escalate and with the promise of uh, moving those troops away from the front. And that's where we sit today. So um, albeit Alina has said that they are moving slowly, uh, it's still a very, very difficult situation uh, between Russian forces on one side and the Ukraine on the other. So in totality, in answer to your question, I think it is very, very serious. Uh, and it is something that needs to be addressed by not just the EU, not just the United States, but also NATO uh, and Russia uh, 
in our ability to be able to sit down and have a dialogue. Um, that becomes hard when we kick each other's diplomats out of the country. Now that's done for a variety of reasons and that's not my decision. But I can tell you that uh, many times, many years that I served in Naples, Italy, Naples was the hub where we conducted the incidents at sea violation um, every other year. It would be in Moscow one year, Naples the other year. Now it's shifted from Moscow one year to Washington, DC. It's become a little bit more bureaucratic. Um, when uh, Russian Federation members came to Naples, we actually sat down and had a pretty productive discussion. I would have my chief of staff do it at the one star level. And we talk about all the issues and incidents that took place that were unsafe and unprofessional conduct or practices in the air and on the sea for the previous year. And we would agree to disagree. And in many cases, we would determine that uh, this cannot stand. I mean, there is uh, no room for a mistake, a, a mistake that could lead to some kind of broader conflict. That's not our job in the military. Our job in the military is to deter. NATO is a defensive alliance. It's not going to snatch anybody else's territory offensively. We defend. And if you've ever listened to uh, General Walters, uh, Supreme Allied Commander, who's a good friend of mine, he will say, we must deter and defend in the Euro-Atlantic theater. And deterrence is 90% of what we do. And that is true. Uh, we demonstrate that uh, we can fight to win, but we want to win without fighting. So with that as an opening narrative, I turn back over to you, Amanda, and I look forward to uh, discussing solutions to this problem uh, so that in the future, we can have a stable secure and peaceful Black Sea arena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, you raised a lot of good points then that I think we're definitely going to come back to. But I just want to turn now to um, Viola. I mean, you're one of the most active MEPs, I would say, um, in this wider Black Sea region. Um, the, the, there seems to be almost something on your agenda every week related to this region. Um, so I'd like to hear from you. I mean, how do you assess the situation um, in this region at the moment and the EU's response? I mean, how would you assess the EU's response to this latest incident um, on the Ukrainian border? I mean, do you think it was sufficient um, or could the EU have done more? I mean, I've heard many critics say the EU was rather silent. It didn't make, it, it didn't make any serious steps. Um, including new sanctions or whatnot. Um, is there something more that the EU could, could have done or could, could be doing now? First of all, thanks a lot, Amanda, and everyone else for having me with all these distinguished experts. And it's really good to be um, amongst like-minded and people who understand um, what is the situation all about, not just in the Black Sea, but um, in the broader, let's say, post-Soviet uh, sphere. And why is it happening? Like, it happened uh, almost every day. Um, um, well, I think the EU response could have been much more clear, um, first on the rhetoric, but then also on um, actions. And uh, I'm, I'm um, delighted to hear that uh, James was more or less um, uh, satisfied with the reaction. I would I would rather name uh, the Biden administration and the Congress than, let's say, the European um, um, External Action Service or um, the Council of um, or the European Council. I mean, we in the Parliament are normally pretty strict and pretty uh, clear with our resolution. Uh, that's that's for sure. But when it comes to clear action, so to negotiate the packages of sanctions. I mean, for example, Belarus, now we are waiting for almost three months to have the fourth uh, package of sanctions. And of course, this is noted by, by President Putin uh, that obviously there's not this unity uh, which we would need uh, to come forward with a proper proposal and which could be voted on, um, on the contrary. Um, and so, especially in the Black Sea, as both of uh, the speakers have mentioned, the Russian presence is more than it has ever happened before. And I'm very grateful to this linkage, which James has uh, drawn uh, between the Sochi uh, uh, Olympic Games and then the Crimea annexation in 2014, because honestly, I was always wondering why um, uh, during the time of the Maidan, uh, the Russian actually kept uh, their feet pretty uh, quiet. And there was no open, um, 
um, um, open, not in, even an attack, but not not a provocation from their side. I mean, they've tried uh, with here and there, sending people from Donbas, giving them money, organizing an anti-Maidan and so on, but it never really worked. Um, and I understood then in the end, of course, they have to protect their uh, the, the, the shine. So there's um, the glamour of, of uh, the Olympic um, Games and they did, did not want to um, let this uh, fail in, in one or the other point. But right after uh, the day um, or the, the um, Olympic Games have finished, they started the operation on Crimea. So it was really... I think 24 hours after the guests uh, from Sochi and Adla have left, <laughs> they started off uh, with this uh, with this uh, hidden agenda on, on the um, Crimea. Um, that was interesting to see that it was not um, um, at that point, it was possible. Nobody cared about Ukraine, nobody cared about uh, Ukraine. And I, I would say we have the same situation now in Mariupol, we have the same situation in the Kerch, um, um, how do you say Kerch, narrowing uh, this, uh, the Kerch? Straits. Straits, Kerch. exactly. Uh, why, well, actually, this is uh, Ukrainian um, territory, and it cannot be used by by Ukrainian uh, ships and boats anymore, and is, is mainly dominated um, by um, Russian uh, Navy and um, uh, um, logistics. Um, so there is not a public outcry. There is not, a, uh, I mean, this is clearly a breach of international law um, and um, we let them do. So if, also, if you speak about uh, that we send out or um, diplomats of the countries, I mean, I would say 99% of those people are not diplomats. This is intelligence service. This is military intelligence uh, service. And this is mainly the problem of what we have seen now in the Czech Republic and other um, embassies that um, the people who work in the embassies are rather less diplomats than uh, GRU officers or other um, intelligent officers. And um, at the end, you were mentioning that we would like to look forward for a stable region, and especially this, uh, since the Gerasimov, um, um, uh, Gerasimov, uh, what, Doctor. how you? Doctor. Yes, it was out in 2012. We have it on paper what uh, Putin has in mind. Uh, so. Currently, we deal in the European Parliament uh, with this um, uh, external uh, influence um, and uh, especially on, on democratic activities, but not only. And uh, there's almost not a single day when we do not hear and listen from any cyber attacks. And on the forefront of the cyber attacks is Georgia, is of course Ukraine. And now with this vaccination diplomacy, and that's why I was listening uh, before so uh, cautiously, uh, we see how much this Sputnik uh, vaccination, for example, is used to destabilize um, the direct neighborhood uh, and also the Baltic Sea region uh, from uh, the Kremlin side. And, and so put this all together, it's not about the hardware, the military, uh, um, uh, deterrence, but it is mainly, let's say, the entire package of action uh, which are designed and organized and operated by the Kremlin, and this is so dangerous. And each and every single um, uh, measure or action or activity to uh, trace and to track and to make sure and to counter and to to um, uh, detect is very, very difficult. And that what makes our life so difficult because with our member states, not each and every one of them um, has the capacities to do so. Uh, sometimes the European External Action Service does not feel responsible for this and the coordination between the European level and the member states is not easy. And we have some personalities uh, in person, for example, with the Commission of Enlargement where you do not exactly know on which ticket he actually works. And so we have a lot of difficulties, uh, which at least for us makes it very um, 
difficult and very uh, complicated to find a coherent li um, line and to show this responsiveness, which would be needed uh, to have this, what you said, the deterrence, not in terms of military, but in, in terms of sanctions and, and other opportunities, for example, when it comes to counter attacks on, uh, in, in the cyberspace. So maybe this would be my first response. Amanda, can I add something, okay, please? Thank you very Good much. Morning. Yes, sure. Um, thank Go you. ahead, yeah, as, So we talked a lot about uh, the line in Donbass, uh, you know, the, the frozen conflict across trenches that resemble the First World War. And I had two grandfathers who fought in the First World War, and my father landed in Normandy in, uh, you know, 1944. So I understand, uh, having heard you know, in family history, what's that, what that's like. But there's another conflict. I mean, it is Black Sea. It is a maritime environment. So uh, I must add that um, on the sea, we are also experiencing an increase in tension. And most recently, with the announcement of closure areas that essentially blockade the Kerch Strait through October 31st. Um, now, back in the transition between 2018 and 19, when the Sea of Azov incident took place between Russian FSB forces and the Ukrainian Navy, uh, I was rather surprised. Uh, there's uh, videotapes on the internet of ramming of one of those ships, and uh, it is a deliberate and unprofessional provocation. And you know, you can all watch that and probably uh, have already seen it. At the time, I said we need to be very careful that this protocol for the Sea of Azov is not exported to the Black Sea. Now, um, Viola mentioned the. Uh, the violations of international law. I mean, what regulates the Sea of Azov is a treaty between Russia that was written during the Cold War and Ukraine. And that is between those two sovereign nations. And under the norms and standards and rules of behavior, they should be able to work it out, but they don't talk about it. Russia takes unilateral action. Building of the Kerch Bridge, um, the incident in the Sea of Azov, and now these closure areas, which are a rather benign way of blockading the Kirk Straits and trying to strangulate Mariupol, which is part of the Ukraine. Um, that is unsatisfactory and that now impacts the Black Sea and international law and UN Convention on Law of the Sea. The Russians tried the same thing during exercise Trident Juncture off the coast of uh, Trondheim in Norway when I was uh, the commander. And just because you declare a closure area for a military exercise doesn't mean you own that body of water. You know, that's a either an economic zone for somebody, and we argue about that, or it is international waters. If there's nothing going on in that zone at the time, uh, any ship has every right to drive right through it. And that's what we did during Trident Juncture. Now this is risky business, and that's why navies and maritime forces uh, tend to be uh, cautious about this because we don't want mistakes and miscalculations to lead to something that is a broader regional conflict or a kinetic exchange between our forces, because that would be very bad. That would be that wouldn't be deterrence and um, we would have failed in our mission. Uh, but when it comes right down to it, this, this blockade using closure areas is completely unsat. Now that it's expanded into the Black Sea, it needs to stop. And let me just leave it there. Thank you. Well, can, can I also add something? Because uh, the Black Sea is the topic which is like a yeah. very okay. painful of mine and not only me. So the, the uh, actual last year, our center has uh, delivered the report on the Black Sea security. And uh, this situation which we have now was like a prognosis there, like um, step by step. So it was quite predictable. We cannot just know the time of the actions, but that was like uh, the situation which was predictable. And you're absolutely right about the Azov Sea where we have this like a problem because of legislation, which also Ukraine need to solve from the point of view, not give Russia additional benefits from it. But at the same time in the Black Sea, we also have this blockage already for a long time. And maybe it was not so obvious with like a building the bridge, but they declared the economic zone around the Crimea, which they closed. Actually, you cannot enter. We had the shooting of the planes, uh, which were passing Ukrainian. Sometimes they were blocking and stopping the um, commercial ships for like a days and days and days. And we have decrease of almost 60% of the uh, commercial roads there in, in Black Sea. 
So, and uh, the, for example, now we have a situation when our uh, oil gas company uh, declared that they want to continue to make um, um, gas shelf um, investigations, uh, which belong, still belong to Ukraine even now, uh, which Russia said that they will accept it as the direct military threat to them and they will react um, responsibly, uh, response there respectively. So um, actually we have this blockage with exercise calling with uh, um, so-called economic uh, uh, zone. Uh, we lost uh, like uh, two thirds of the Black Sea uh, Equatoria, which we cannot control and we cannot enter. And uh, the uh, position of Turkey also makes some kind of uh, influence on in this situation. So this is obviously the situation and it was for a long time out of the NATO attention at all. So it took like a one year of the very extensive work to pay attention to the Black Sea. And for your understanding, the Russian till to, uh, 2027, they will increase uh, their capabilities, their like a ship capabilities 10 times uh comparing to uh before the crimea occupation and missile capabilities more than three times from the range of the uh range and number of missiles so actually they cover all the europe with um, missile force now now and that's why it's not the problem of ukraine only thanks okay thank thank you alina um i now want to give the floor to sergey because he's been sitting there um, very patiently hearing a lot of things about uh, about Russia. Um, so I would like to give you the opportunity, Sergei, to uh, to respond um, to what you've actually heard already. Um, but also, if you could perhaps elaborate, I mean, what do you see as Russia's, you know, main yeah. objectives in this region? I mean, it seems like Russia wants to keep everybody, you know, on the edge, if I can put it that way, by behaving in sometimes in quite an unpredictable unpredictable way, although you could say predictably unpredictable, perhaps. Um, there's a, there's a, there happens to be a sort of draft external action service paper um, floating around the town these days that says that Moscow um, is ulti ultimately um, seeking to absorb parts of Ukraine um, in, into Russia. So it'd be um, nice to hear your comments on that as well. Um, but I give the floor to you now, Sergei. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for inviting me. And it's uh, not the first time I hear a lot of things about Russia that are probably controversial back in Moscow. But uh, then in Moscow, also, you have a diversity of views uh, on uh, everything that happens. And uh, I uh, will try also to um, understand, uh, to um, analyze uh, the Russian official attitude that uh, has to be made part of, part of the calculation, any political calculation that we make on the region to understand the, the, the actions uh, that uh, are implemented in this, uh, in this area. Um, and uh, although many uh, things were already touched upon, uh, I uh, would try to indeed focus on uh, what we started with uh, um, all these um, um, exercises, uh, forces uh, in the area and what this all could uh, uh, mean. Uh, I think the most important word that we heard already from um, uh, almost every participant at this panel and um, uh, also in um, uh, most um, articles on the issue that you could read in newspapers, uh, you could also find it. Uh, and uh, these articles were written by people who uh, were very far from uh, being apologetic to the Kremlin. Um, you could find this word demonstration. Uh, so basically, the conclusion was that uh, uh, this uh, wasn't really the beginning of the large conflict in itself, uh, what we uh, saw in the last uh, months, um, but that was a demonstration. Uh, from the Russian side, you heard that these were the exercises. Um, I don't really see much of a contradiction here because uh, large exercises are most often demonstration and uh, a military demonstration is uh, in some way an exercise. Um, and then you uh, might ask yourself uh, what's indeed the, the, the goal uh, of this demonstration, what uh, was supposed to be demonstrated. And uh, my 
feeling is that uh, indeed the key here uh, was the ability uh, to um, assemble forces as well as de-escalate. Uh, that uh, you uh, can uh, use uh, the military potential that you have quite a, in a versatile way. Uh, you uh, can uh, um, change uh, the direction of their movement uh, in accordance with uh, your um, idea of what, have, what has to happen. Uh, and uh, this uh, um, was probably successfully shown to uh, every actor involved. You um, indeed had a, an impression that uh, Russia does have the potential in the area, which has not yet been used uh, in uh, um, any direct military confrontation, but that could be brought to the area if needed. And then the question is, what's the next step? Uh, I think uh, it uh, uh, must be acknowledged that uh, it's not uh, really in the uh, interest uh, of uh, the Russian government at this point, especially with uh, all the um, economic, social issues uh, related to the pandemic and uh, many others, uh, uh, to uh, start any all-out conflict that would just um, um, eclipse uh, uh, the things that we saw in the Donbas. Uh, probably uh, also one of the conclusions that we could make from uh, this uh, last month that indeed uh, I uh, know that uh, in, in Ukraine there is an ins insistence on, on, on calling uh, what's happening in the Donbas uh, the Russia-Ukraine war, but we also understand that the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, which is uh, indeed like a full-scale conflict, would be on a very different uh, uh, level. Uh, that would be a much uh, bigger catastrophe for everyone, and if you ask me, also including Russia. Uh, so this is the scenario that has to be avoided. But then, uh, if uh, uh, this is uh, not the desirable scenario, also for the Russian government, what's uh, uh, the actual goal? And indeed, I think the actual goal is uh, to be successful in the uh, negotiations. Uh, you uh, had, uh, on many occasions, uh, people in the West saying that um, you need to negotiate from a position of strength. This uh, has been uh, repeatedly misinterpreted in Russia like uh, a, 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 military, um, a, a, a military push that uh, they wanted to make vis-a-vis -vis Russia with this position of strength. But what people say most often, uh, they say that uh, uh, to be successful in negotiations, you have to be strong and capable which is uh, the most obvious uh, uh, logical conclusion, uh, which is also made on the Russian side, that if you are uh, capable, if you demonstrate your capabilities, uh, you may be more successful in negotiations. And uh, what negotiations are about, just briefly, uh, of course, uh, the key thing, and the thing that I think we should concentrate on and we don't concentrate enough on, is the negotiations around the Donbas. Uh, unlike many people, I don't think that these negotiations are doomed, uh, that they are in a stalemate that uh, is just uh, the end point and uh, uh, they cannot be developed from there. I think on the contrary, uh, we need to look for the solutions uh, also with the engagement of um, uh, Western countries that are involved in that, not necessarily just uh, uh, France and Germany that are part of the Normandy format, but maybe uh, also the EU and uh, uh, the position of the United States will also play a role. But also, if we just focus on the Black Sea, then uh, the uh, matter for, if you like, negotiations that haven't yet started or um, uh, are not yet brought to any negotiations table, uh, is uh, indeed the uh, tricky balance between NATO presence and Russia presence in the region. Uh, because we talked a lot about the Russia presence, but uh, we have to remember uh, that uh, in the Black Sea, you have uh, several uh, NATO members, including Turkey, which is uh, basically the uh, second uh, biggest uh, military weight after uh, the uh, United States in terms of the manpower. 
uh, of their armed forces. Uh, and um, we have uh, two countries that can be, can be called aspirants of NATO, uh, Ukraine and Georgia that want to join the alliance. So basically, you do have a very strong presence of the alliance uh, in uh, the sea. Uh, you have uh, constant, constant monitoring by uh, US um, heavy military drones that just fly around the Crimea all the time. Uh, you have uh, US and uh, UK Navy that uh, are almost on a rotational basis uh, visits uh, the Black Sea just to demonstrate their presence and to also cooperate with uh, friendly countries, including Ukraine. Uh, so the, you, you, you do have uh, a lot of NATO presence in this area. And I think uh, when uh, NATO says that they don't want to uh, give Russia any veto right over NATO's actions, uh, this can also be mirrored on the Russian side. So one of the uh, meanings of uh, this uh, Russian military activity is to make sure that NATO doesn't have a veto right over what Russia does in this area, to make sure that Russia is capable to do what the Russian government decides rather than what the um, countries around uh, uh, tell it. Uh, so I think this is uh, the state of affairs that we have um, in this in this area. I totally agree that uh, this uh, um, can become dangerous if it's uh, not uh, really a matter of attention. And uh, I uh, still hope that it can be made a matter of attention in a good way uh, in terms of uh, uh, talks that can be uh, held indeed in the NATO Russia Council, which still exists. Uh, some people already forgot about it, but uh, it's still there and could be used for uh, negotiations on these matters. And um, uh, I, I just hope that when it comes to the Navy, you know, uh, there is a sort of a stereotype, and uh, I, I hope it is, an, it is a true stereotype about the Navy that um, uh, people who uh, serve in the Navy in different countries. Uh, they are more able to find a common language than uh, some, some others, including politicians. Uh, so probably it's one of the ingredients that could help us to move forward in spite of the conflictual environment that will not disappear anytime soon. Can, can I comment also no, on, 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 um, on one? Hang on a minute. Um, Alina, um, Sergey, thank you very, thank you very much. I, I'm going to come back to the issue of NATO in a moment, but before I move on to Alina again, I just want to ask you a, a question related to to Washington, um, to President Biden. I mean, he's had a much tough, a, quite a tough response, tough approach towards Russia since he came into power. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, what what do people in the Kremlin think about uh, think about Biden, and um, what's Biden's you know pushback? Um, following Russia's, you know, uh, build up on the Ukrainian border, did that play a role in the Russians um, pulling back their troops? I, I don't think that uh, what we are talking about specifically in the Black Sea was uh, targeted targeted that much uh, at uh, Biden and uh, his policy course. But uh, I, I, I do think that he is seen as a uh, um, uh, very serious uh, personality who is much more capable to um, um, bring back uh, logic and coherence in the US uh, policy machinery. Uh, so this uh, policy machinery will probably produce uh, results uh, faster and in a more coherent manner than uh, what we saw during the uh, Trump's presidency. And then the question is uh, where it will go uh, in the relations with Russia. Uh, you did see some uh, tough steps, uh, including the continuation of sanctions, but I also think that uh, uh, President Biden was uh, very serious when he spoke about the importance of uh, the personal meeting with President Putin, uh, when he spoke about this uh, summit that they are trying to arrange, and um, of course the uh, diplomatic wars, the uh, uh, diplomats who are expelled, the embassy staff that is uh, cut, uh, it is not helpful in terms of uh, uh, achieving the result at the summit, but still I think it does not deprive us of uh, the uh, least chance uh, to succeed with the summit. So the, 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 the most important thing is to fill the summit with substance. Uh, not to make it just a photo opportunity, and I think if it is uh, just a photo opportunity, then both presidents just uh, won't uh, participate. 
um, and uh, uh, then to have uh, this uh, military de-escalation. And if you like uh, a discussion on the red lines that shouldn't be crossed as uh, uh, part of this uh, summit agenda, which is, I think, possible. And uh, it will most probably be the insistence uh, of uh, at least uh, Washington. And uh, I also think that for, for Russia, uh, explaining the red lines in terms of NATO activities um, uh, just uh, as important. So there is a way forward also in this uh, US-Russia relationship in spite of the tough moves made by both sides re uh, recently. Okay, thank you. Um, Alina, I would like to stay on the topic um, of NATO with you now. I mean, there was the recent visit of um, Secretary of State Blinken um, to Ukraine that seemed to go um, quite well. So I'd be interested to hear your assessment of this visit. Um, but also, I mean, unfortunately, nobody, I mean, he wasn't, let's say, forthcoming in terms of a possible, you know, map um, for Ukraine or anything along those lines? I mean, was this perceived, you know, how was this perceived in Ukraine with, with, with disappointment? Um, obviously it's the same for Georgia. I mean, you could say it's even worse for Georgia. I mean, Georgia should actually already be a member of NATO. You know, they meet the criteria, but I mean, it seems that NATO isn't ready or some member states aren't ready to deliver um, a map or, you know, help Ukraine along this track. So how do you, how do you view this, this topic of, of MAP, but also the visit of um, Blinken um, more generally? Um, well, thank you. First of all, I'd like, like a small comment about the presence of NATO in the Black Sea, because uh, we can observe um, that uh, for the period before war, this presence was like a drastic low. And that was one of the uh, factors which influenced on the possible occupation, because in 2008, for example, when the troubles with Georgia or uh, war with Georgia happened, we had 29 ship, uh, 29 um, like uh, times when the NATO ships were present in the Black Sea. And in 2013, before occupation of Crimea, it was just eight. So it was like a drastically increased and this region was not interested for, for interesting for NATO. And that was like an obvious one of the factors which gave the floor to Putin. Now talking about the current political situation with NATO. Okay, so that's like a complex issue, complex issue and the, um, actually the visit itself uh, was good, let's say, because uh, there were some connections established and opinions exchanged. It had some um tough results for ukraine from the point of view of um let's say requests uh to ukrainian government for the continuation of the uh, political and technical and military support from us which i cannot re reject that they are just like completely fair i would say so uh there is a huge uh, number of homework to be done by ukraine uh to not to let's say to, to to be able to support partnership not just like uh, some other position of the us and eu and nato from the another point of view the nato issue is let's say this is not the issue of interoperability or readiness because you're absolutely right when you said that the georgia is completely ready from the point of interoperability and standards and we saw many members of nato who were not ready at all from the point of view of uh, uh, readiness and capabilities of them who were beca who became the member of the NATO. Let's say that this is more political decision. And I would say that now the problem was partially created by uh, Ukrainian government, unfortunately, because uh, they started from the beginning of this year to declare it too intensively that we will be, we will get this map. Uh, declarations, that's good. And this is some kind of influence of uh, advocacy, but uh, they're good when you have like a, a very strong arguments in the current situation. So I would say that uh, it was, um, uh, I just remember what, what, how, how many efforts we were put in in getting the EOP. This is a partner of the special partnership uh, from NATO last year. So it was like a tremendous work of half a year, not public when you just like delivering constantly arguments why you 
uh, can do it and starting from the point when they, we have a Germany, France and many, many other countries who were uh, against it for half a year, we can make them turn into it and uh, Ukraine got this EOP status from NATO. So I think that this um, uh, problem has two parts, political decision of NATO countries. This is not the decision about interoperability or capabilities. And we need to work uh, with this very hard uh, with our diplomatic forces. And the second, this is the, uh, let's say, realistic evaluation of Ukrainian government also. Because I would say that for today, Georgia has much more, um, let's say, scores for uh, getting this map. And who knows, maybe they will get it now. Ukraine, obviously not. And uh, we need to solve it in diplomatic way, in po political way, more than just open declarations. Okay, thank you, um, Alina. And staying on the same topic, um, Jamie, um, I would like to ask you, you know, what's your predictions for the forthcoming um, NATO summit in terms of the issue of Black Sea security? Because this, this was on the agenda at the last NATO summit as well, as I remember, and there wasn't any significant enhancement of NATO's, let's say, um, a, a policy on, or approach on the region. Is this something you, could, you would recommend um, that NATO leaders should beef up a bit um, their current approach to the Black Sea region. Uh, and on a bilateral level, do you think there's more that Washington could do to support to support Ukraine's ability to defend it to defend itself? Amanda, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, it's a very important question. Um, you know, I'm not uh, an active duty officer anymore. I am not. Uh, serving in any capacity for NATO. I provide my personal opinion. I have the utmost respect for the Secretary General and the Alliance and what they've accomplished in you know, over 72 years of deterrence in uh, Europe and in the extended region. You know, there's 14,000 people uh, unarguably have uh, been hurt, killed, injured since the beginning of the war. The US has provided $2 billion in security assistance. And you're right. Um, you know, Secretary Blinken uh, has been in Ukraine recently in Kyiv. Uh, President Biden had uh, a conversation with President Zelensky about uh, stability and security. Uh, we've offered aid packages in terms of ships. Uh, while I was in Europe, uh, two island class cutters went into the Black Sea, became part of the Ukrainian Navy. My chief of staff, where I'm on Matt Zirkel, commissioned them. More uh, Mark VI patrol craft uh, are going in to augment uh, the Ukrainian Navy. That's about $125 million package. And there's another $150 million that's held in advance uh, in return for uh, continued reforms in Ukraine with regards to good governance. And I foot stomp that good governance is necessary before that aid package will go in. So for the upcoming NATO summit, I think what's important for the allies and the partners to discuss with regards to Ukraine is how to stop the violence and how to get back to something uh, which looks like a normal. You know, we always define new normals. Uh, today, the new normal is no fighting on either side of the trench in Donbass. What I would like to see is a sovereign Ukraine restored to its original borders. Um, what happens inside the chambers of NATO, uh, you know, with the, the presidents of nations and uh, in the North Atlantic Council is really their discussions. They're not outcomes. And then it is up to the alliance to operationalize uh, those directives once consensus is reached and then execute those plans. So with regards to the Black Sea region and in particular Ukraine and Georgia, I think uh, I would recommend that the following things be on the agenda. First of all, increasing our presence in the Black Sea more so than it is today. You know, Sergey was very generous in his comments about NATO's presence in the Black Sea. I don't think you can have enough. And, uh, and certainly there are limitations in the Montreux Convention and my hats off to Turkey for doing a great job in the way that they uh, maintain, uh, you know, cooperation and collaboration through Montreux with all of the Black Sea nations, Russia included, and the United States as we sail into those waters and those international waters to provide peace and security. I think it would be important for uh, one nation, perhaps Romania, to stand up and offer 
uh, a persistent presence uh, from a port like Constanta in the Black Sea for you know more than just aperiodic exercises, but things that happen all the time for training of NATO and partner navies to include Bulgaria, to include Turkey, and to include Georgia and Ukraine and the United States and other NATO nations who sail in there as standing NATO maritime groups or as NATO ships under a US flag. And Jim Stavridis taught me a long time ago never to say the word the US and NATO because US is part of NATO. We are part of those 30 nations. Uh, on the issue of uh, lethality, I think that the Ukraine has every right by the UN Charter, Article 51, to defend its sovereign territory. Therefore, it has the right to use lethal weapons. Now, some of those weapons have been transferred uh, through agreements with the Ukraine to the United States, the Javelin anti-tank system, uh, sniper systems and anti-sniper systems, because the conditions in those uh, trenches are very, very dangerous with uh, uh, snipers on the other side. So we've tried to help out there. I think more is needed, and I think more should be authorized because Ukraine is a sovereign nation. Ukraine didn't invade anybody else. They were invaded, and they have the right to defend uh, their sovereignty both on the land and on sea. As far as a map plan, a matter of debate for many, many years, and um, you know, we heard about it during Maidan. Uh, it was put on hold. Uh, some of your uh, questions that are coming in from uh, people that are watching the webinar, webinar on the outside, or you know, where are we going? Isn't this all about NATO membership or EU membership? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's about uh, the transition uh, of Georgia and the Ukraine to their uh, stated choice of integration in Euro-Atlantic institutions. That includes the EU, and for that matter, Turkey as well aspires to Euro-Atlantic institutions. Turkey is a NATO member. Georgia and Ukraine are not. Why shouldn't they be? I don't think they pose a threat to Russia, although Russia has clearly stated that this is encroachment. I don't understand that. And the reason I don't understand that is because NATO is a defensive alliance. Article five is all about defense. An attack on one is an attack on all. We don't grab anybody else's territory. We're not interested in doing that. We've got plenty to take care of ourselves. So why shouldn't the Ukraine and Georgia start a map plan and uh, work towards NATO membership? Some may say that would increase tensions uh, even further. This is a matter for debate inside the chambers of the North Atlantic Council, I think. Whether or not they get there, whether or not this is on the agenda, I don't know. But I think it is something, as I said, this is discussions in Brussels, not outcomes. It is something that should be discussed. Sergei made some great points. Uh, first of all, thank you, Sergei, for saying that naval officers seem to figure out how to sit down with one another and have a dialogue and reach compromise. I agree with you on that. I think navies are very good at this, and they have been for hundreds of years because we sail all over the world, maintain sea lines of communication and security, and then we go into ports in all sorts of places, and we meet all sorts of people of different cultures, different backgrounds, different opinions and different languages, and we carry on a conversation. So I think that that dialogue is very important and that dialogue should continue. Um, you know, you talked about demonstrations. Uh, I think demonstrations, the likes of what occurred in Donbass are very dangerous because of the potential for mistakes and miscalculations. So we need to be very wary of that and remind ourselves that military forces' primary responsibility is to deter, and ultimately, if they have to, to defend. I wear the tie of my former headquarters in Naples, Italy. Uh, the symbol of the headquarters is the Lion of St. Mark's from Venice. But I always like to remind people that the lion's paw is on a book of peace, Pax. But in the lion's left hand is a sword to defend if necessary. And that really is the reason for the alliance. And the reason the alliance has been so successful in 72 years of avoiding conflict and avoiding war. So um, lots to discuss in uh, the chambers in Brussels, uh, not just the Black Sea, but other areas of the world that are important, particularly concerns over other rising powers to include China 
and uh, to discuss presence of NATO navies, for instance, the Queen Elizabeth and the Dutch and the Americans sailing into the Indian Ocean and to the South China Sea. So uh, lots on the plate. You know, Secretary General Stoltenberg and I got to know each other fairly well through Trident Juncture, and he is the ultimate Viking. He was the prime minister of his country for 10 years and is now the Secretary General and doing a great job. And he came up and talked to us. And one of the things that he said was um, the best uh, part of the alliance, one of the strongest uh, pillars of the alliance is the ability to adapt and change over time. And so the alliance has shifted from you know, primarily a Cold War bipolar organization to this multilateral organization conducting out of area operations and maintaining the peace in a much broader sphere of influence. And uh, you know, one of the demonstrations of that that has nothing to do with the Black Sea, but it's pretty important for uh, both Eastern Europe and Northern Europe is the NATO Strategic Direction South Hub uh, that was started in Naples on my watch. We took it to full operational capability. It's all about the conflict in Africa, the Sahel, Middle East and North Africa, which leads to illegal migration, illegal narcotics, illegal and illicit weapons trafficking, which is bad for Europe. It's bad for the United States, bad for the Balkans, bad for the Black Sea. So NATO's got a full plate. And uh, uh, bottom line, I hope they get to these very important issues, but I do not have insight into the exactitude of that agenda. One can only hope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jimmy. I would like to come back to you now, Viola. I would like to take one of the questions now we have um, here in the chat box, the question from Andrew Duff. Um, who is asking whether um, is collaboration between EU and NATO sufficiently deep and systematic, both at a strategic and operational level? Um, I'm not sure. If, is that something that you would um, you would be able to tackle? Well, to be honest, since I'm not uh, in the um, in the city, uh, not in the in the military security. Um, field here so much, it would be a little bit difficult uh, to, to answer this sufficiently. Um, I was actually going to shift a little bit more from this military uh, cooperation uh, between NATO and EU to the also civilian opportunities, which we haven't used so far in terms of connectivity. I was always very skeptical when Misha Saakashvili um, at that time proposed a new deep sea harbor, uh, Anaklia, in Georgia. And I thought, why? Why do we need this? But now, uh, especially because of the very brutal and open uh, presence of the Russians, I think we need it. Yes, we need it more than ever. And what you have said, uh, James, with Constanza as a maybe a potential uh, harbor or as a as, as, a, as a NATO presence, a, a maritime presence. Yes, but we could also um, have this as a, um, a better linkage, as a, as a better um, uh, connection to Georgia and to Ukraine from your Romanian part and from uh, the EU part in terms of ferries, in, <clears throat> in terms of logistics, in terms of whatsoever. And to um, develop uh, those things uh, much more offensively and, and engaged and uh, also uh, really to, to show this kind of protection uh, towards Ukraine and Georgia, I think would be a big step forward. And one more little comment on uh, the Blinken visit and, and Ukraine and the potential map. I was actually pretty happy because I wasn't aware that NATO has not just uh, conditions on the uh, interoperability and in terms of military um, preparedness, but also they want, as they have said, um, a consolidated uh, democracy. And why we see a lot of backlashes in uh, Ukraine for the last weeks and months uh, I was very glad that at least Blinken reminded uh, the current Ukrainian uh, government on their own homework. And uh, NATO has a huge leverage and I'm very glad that they have used it and they have announced and made clear why it is so difficult for NATO, for the US and for all the other partners to support a non-consolidated democracy as Ukraine is and with a uh, stepping back from the achieved reforms uh, during the last Poroshenko era, I think it was very helpful that Lincoln made sure 
that at least we need some more um, of this homework uh, being achieved so successfully. In terms of the question um, I see and what I've heard from NATO that they rather cooperate with uh, individual member states. They have, um, uh, I mean, we do not have a proper intelligence. We do not have uh, um, on the European level what would be needed uh, to, to share um, um, information. And so what I've heard from, from NATO that they rather work with individual capitals and they are very much afraid of some capitals to share information with. And that makes it also very difficult. While we have some capitals which are obviously not trustful enough, be it Vienna sometimes, why we know that uh, parts of, uh, of the Obviously, the Austrian um, uh, military or defense ministry is, is um, under some strange control, uh, be it Budapest, be it different. So in that respect, I do understand and I respect, uh, yes, the NATO uh, decision to work with uh, uh, the trustful partners amongst the member states. Amanda, can I? Um, add thank, thank you, uh, Viola. Yes, yeah, sure, J Jamie, if you can add quickly, because then I want to go to Sergey. Yes, absolutely. And we deserve to give Sergey equal time. Um, and we look forward to hearing from him. So one of the things that, you know, as far as presence goes, um, and our chief of naval operations, uh, Mike Gilday, is fond of saying virtual presence equals actual absence. So you've got to be there to project, you know, power and, and to project deterrence in order to be effective. Um, just a couple of days ago, I think that uh, the Alliance finished and in, in, in Six Fleet headquarters finished up the final planning conference for this year's Sea Breeze exercise. Now, Breeze and Sea Breeze were two of my favorite exercises. And uh, this could be a banner year for up to 33 uh, nations participating in some way, shape or form in Sea Breeze. I think that sends a, uh, you know, as far as uh, Sergey's position on uh, demonstrations. I think that uh, sends a very uh, loud message um, to anybody that might threaten the sovereignty of a NATO partner or a NATO nation uh, in the Black Sea. And the reason that's important is it increases the risk calculus for the other guy. So if you're not sure that you're going to be successful, you won't take the risk. So I, I, I laud the efforts in Seabreeze, and I look forward to that uh, happening in the next couple of months and the positive outcomes from it. And uh, that's probably something that ought to be brought up uh, at the NATO summit as well. And, you know, what are we doing to enhance the quality of the continuum of presence across the Black Sea region in the next year? Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, Sergey, I would like to put one of the questions that's in the chat box um, to you. And this is the question from Parviz um, Yaromad. Um, and he's asking, um, do you think um, Ukraine and Georgia's accession to NATO um, would trigger a war? Um, I'm guess trigger a war with Russia. Um, what's your what's your what's your opinion on that? If I might ask. Well, accession doesn't happen one day, and uh, I think we all understand that it's a pretty difficult process, uh, also in terms of NATO, but uh, for the EU, it's even more difficult uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, states of the Western Balkans uh, that made much more progress uh, on the way to the EU, they still uh, wait for even uh, uh, more or less understanding what uh, the date could be for their actual accession, uh, could be 25, could be later than that. Uh, uh, and uh, for Ukraine and Georgia, uh, the EU is uh, even uh, further away. Uh, NATO is uh, in a way uh, uh, more realistic, but also more dangerous because, yes, I think uh, in uh, uh, Russia, you do have an attitude to NATO that is uh, uh, very critical. And uh, uh, the feeling that um, uh, the uh, direct uh, contact with uh, even more NATO countries might lead to uh, new uh, clashes of this or that size. I don't think that we can uh, at this point uh, predict uh, whether this could uh, lead to war or not. But uh, the thing is that uh, I think 
uh, there is uh, too much of uh, West, Western mainstream thinking that sort of ignores uh, the benefits of uh, neutral status. Uh, we uh, should get back to thinking about how to probably strengthen this uh, uh, neutral status, how to make countries that do not choose uh, military alliances feel safe and secure. I understand totally that the development of the Ukraine crisis didn't help in this uh, regard and uh, uh, that uh, in the absence of uh, all this uh, tragedy through the last uh, seven years, we could possibly have found an easier solution, but we have to act from uh, where we are now. We cannot uh, go back in history. And I still think that even, even after the events of the last years, it, it still has to be um, considered like an option that countries that do not join uh, military alliances might feel safe and secure through some system of guarantees that are provided to them. Um, uh, if uh, any dialogue on security issues is uh, possible in the area uh, with uh, also participation engagement of Russia, uh, I think uh, it is um, uh, still an option, whatever the choices made by Ukraine, Georgia on NATO EU issues. So everybody knows that they declared officially or even in the case of Ukraine included in their constitution, uh, their aspirations uh, with regard to Euro-Atlantic structures. Um, but uh, uh, nevertheless, if we talk about the resolution of the Donbas crisis, uh, it has to be resolved with the involvement of uh, Kiev and Moscow, and not just Kiev and Moscow in the abstract, but uh, those people who are currently at power there. So you cannot just uh, sit and wait uh, forever until you have some other negotiators in each of the capitals. You have to bring them at the negotiations table and make them talk. Um, just today, uh, there was a ceremony when um, uh, new ambassadors who came to Moscow uh, presented their credentials to President Putin. And uh, among them were the ambassadors of Romania and uh, Moldova. Uh, and uh, President Putin, he said uh, a few words on uh, relations with uh, every country. Um, he, among other things, said that uh, he sees uh, the resolution of the Transnistrian crisis uh, with the uh, full respect of uh, Moldovan territorial integrity, which uh, he could avoid saying while, well, this is long-standing Russian official position, but still it uh, was not pleasant to hear for some people in Transnistria. Uh, he said uh, with regard to the Romanian ambassador that uh, uh, he thinks uh, Russia and Romania could have a dialogue on Black Sea issues, uh, which is um, also something that he could avoid saying. So I think uh, there is a room of maneuver uh, for diplomats, uh, and uh, if they use it properly, uh, probably we will see less uh, uh, military maneuvers uh, in uh, uh, the upcoming years, uh, which uh, would, um, I think, benefit all countries of, these, uh, of this region. Um, I would like to argue with Sergey a little bit, um, uh, because, um, you know, for the last 300 uh, years, we've been observing the, uh, like, uh, policy of Russia towards its neighbors. Uh, never, it depends from nothing. I mean, that it depends from no alliances, no uh, desires, nothing. It's just the decision of Russia that we want more land, more influence, and to bring the chaos to the international uh, uh, like a law and order, and that's it. And I do not trust, and I think that most of the people in Europe now in the world do not trust no any words. And uh, should uh, Russia or Putin want to solve the Transnistria crisis, it's just like a five minutes of for solution. So you cannot declare, uh, well, you can declare whatever you wish, but if you have the solution on the like a end of your fingers and do not do this, that's like a proof of everything. I should say that, uh, well, uh, the any consideration about the neutral status can be um, for those countries who consider neutral status for them acceptable. Ukraine considers not. 
we have the long history when we understood that the one of the and in any um, like a modern defense policies of UK of US of every country, it is said that the uh, defense cooperation, including alliances, is one of the capabilities. You cannot solve the issues by yourself. Uh, this is the contemporary world. So the Ukrainian solution is to be a member of alliances. And uh, I don't think that in the like nearest future, someone in Ukraine will be ready to discuss the neutral status uh, because we had this neutral status. We had no declared desire to go to NATO, but we still had the war on our borders. So it doesn't save us, no Georgia, no Transnistria and Moldova from uh, violation of its borders and annexation, uh, which proves that this is the wrong way. I mean, that we have a lot of proofs that you cannot allow yourself to be neutral in this situation. So this is uh, like, uh, uh, again, and talking about the NATO, uh, NATO now is drafting their its strategy for 2030, like, like uh, for 30 years ahead, or like till uh, 2030. And it's very important to see their, um, their uh, let's say, strategies toward not only Black Sea, but all those areas which traditionally what were not the focus for NATO because they were not like a focused for uh, uh, their member states. Because as we see the Black Sea situation influence a lot at NATO, as we see the China influence a lot at NATO, although you, NATO doesn't have like a direct presence there, shouldn't have direct presence there. So that's more complex than it was like a 50 years before. And it's very important to see there and the Ukrainian community puts a lot of efforts now like on delivering message to uh, NATO headquarters that we are ready to give our proposals on this uh, strategy, on this vision of how NATO would be developed uh, uh, till 2030. And uh, I think that this is Ukrainian right uh, to choose its own way, but do not and the one of the biggest mistake i would say of nato countries and eu countries is to um, discuss the ukrainian membership or partnership through the prism of russian uh, attitude because it this attitude will never change so that's like a, a status quo which we have and uh, so that the, uh, it should be like a direct conversation between Ukraine, Georgia and many other countries and NATO or EU, not through Russia and its decisions. Thank you, Alina. We actually ran out of time, but I would like to give each of the remaining speakers, you know, one minute. Um, to make a final comment and perhaps, you know, say what you think is going to be the biggest challenge um, in the in the upcoming months for the for this region. In one minute each, please. So I give it to you first, Jamie. Thank you, Amanda. It's been a great discussion. And uh, thanks to all around the table for making this a collegial and balanced discussion and not a heated discussion about issues uh, that are uh, so uh, you know, fractured and tense in the region. Um, as I listened and you know, I heard uh, Sergey talk about neutrality and Alina's response to that uh, with dealing with the Russians for the last 300 years, I would remind you, you know, one of my favorite authors, uh, Robert Kaplan wrote this great book in Europe's shadow about the Black Sea. And uh, he takes you back uh, longer than that. Um, the history in the Ukraine region and Crimea, go, Crimea goes back 3,000 years with Greeks, with Tartars, with Ukraines, uh, with Turks under the Ottomans, and then the Russians for about 200 years of that period, 200 years of 3,000 years. So I uh, submit that Russia does not have a right uh, to uh, occupy Crimea as it is doing right now. And uh, the question of neutrality uh, could probably be more easily discussed if uh, the Russian Federation withdrew all of its forces from Crimea and restored the sovereignty of the entirety of the state of Ukraine. And then perhaps we could have a dialogue about neutrality and military alliances and a map plan for NATO in that context. If there is no threat, uh, then why would you need uh, to be part of the alliance? 
thank you so much for the opportunity today. And uh, I look forward to feedback uh, from the webinar uh, guests as well, because I know you're going to put this out and uh, it'll be reproduced and other people have a chance to weigh in. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you, Jamie. Um, some last thoughts from you, uh, Viola. Thanks a lot. Well, that was very inspiring, in a, as you said, in a very construct and constructive and positive sense. And why we not only stay in Kiev next week uh, when we are there with the Green delegation, we also hopefully will have an opportunity to go to the contact line, to go even to Mariupol, to have a uh, talk with some of uh, the soldiers there, the officers there. Um, I, I will keep in mind what all of you have said, and uh, we will see what they would like. I mean, what the expectations of the soldiers on the ground is, on the um, population side, and so on. And um, I'm very much uh, looking forward to have an ideal world where we do not need these alliances, these um, uh, military alliances. Um, it would be much better not to spend 2% of our GDP uh, into hardware of military, which hopefully will not ever use. Uh, but um, as long as uh, we have this uh, mutual uh, mistrust and even this real um, threat, um, I would say it's okay if a country and a sovereign country such as Ukraine, such as Georgia decides to join uh, an alliance uh, and we would, should make sure that they can express their wish, their demand um, and make their decision um, um, yeah, on their own will without interference from any side. And we see in the European Union that there is not a growing, let's say, interest or a growing um, support for this, but at least um, I, I see that um, people acknowledge and understand that it would be a necessary step to um, um, include those countries into the North Atlantic Treaty. Thank you very much for this very interesting webinar. Thank you. And the last word, um... For you, Sergei. Um, well, just a brief remark on uh, these uh, references to history and uh, the past centuries that uh, could probably be repeated. Um, you know, I'm I, I, I like history studies, and uh, I'm all into that. But uh, I still think we are living at the unique uh, time of uh, much uh, faster communications and. Uh, much bigger dangers in technological terms, uh, in terms of the population that grew, that uh, became more educated. So I think uh, recipes uh, from the past centuries will not work for this time and will, will not work for the future. If we try to uh, always uh, go back to uh, what uh, happened in the past, uh, we will not find the way to the better future for all of us. So I think uh, we should be careful about about just uh, drawing historical parallels. In uh, terms of uh, um, the uh, possible developments in this, in this area, uh, I think, yes, of course, you do have uh, scenarios uh, that suggest uh, uh, further conflict, uh, but uh, knowing about these scenarios should be exactly the reason why we should be looking for uh, ways to bring it back to the negotiations table and uh, to create the uh, measures uh, that could uh, increase uh, confidence between the uh, parties, even if they disagree on very important issues, uh, like uh, Russia and Ukraine disagree on Crimea and Russia and the West, um, uh, uh, and to uh, at least avoid the military escalation. I think this is the, 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 the minimal that should be achieved. And if we are able to achieve this, uh, we could proceed with the uh, uh, further steps looking for political solutions. Thank you, Sergei. Um, with that, I have to close this event. Thanks to all of you for coming and joining us today. I know you're all very busy people, so I really appreciate the time that you've taken from your agendas, giving us your, I think, very thought-provoking insights indeed into this this topic i know it's not an easy topic to talk about 
um, and EPC will be continuing to work on this on this area in, into the future, both on the, the Black Sea region and beyond. I would also like to thank the audience for joining us today and for putting their questions. We look forward to seeing you at, at future events. We have a number of things coming up on the horizon related to Ukraine. Uh, and also to Georgia's NATO aspirations in a couple of weeks before the NATO summit. Um, so thanks again to everybody, and I look forward to seeing you on the next time. And have a great afternoon. And thank you for the interest to Ukraine.